Hi, I'm Ed Chung. I've been years. I'm also an internal medicine physician. Again, creating a series of videos to hopefully help others with Meniere's or to get other people to understand what Meniere's is and, and to understand the disease process and things that they can do for this. This is the video section six in which I'm going to talk about medications for Meniere's. And specifically, this is video 6.1, one of five sections where I'm going to talk about medications. This video 6.1, I'm going to dedicate to diuretics, which are, quote, water pills. Uh, this is the mainstay of therapy that Western medicine actually has to offer for um, in years. Okay. The, again, let me re review, and I'm sure you've watched my other videos or you understand that the reason or cause for Meniere's is that this middle ear area, or, sorry, not the middle ear, but inner ear area, swells. Okay, it swells with extra amount of fluid in there. And with that extra fluid in there, um, if you look at the, the, the hearing area here, um, that extra fluid causes this whole structure, which is your hearing structure, cochlear structure, and your balance structure, to get very, 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 very swollen and push in on the nerves so that they don't function correctly. The actual production of the fluid is from the mediascalia, which is the middle membrane, this tiny little middle membrane in this entire cochlea. That's those little tiny little cells in there actually produce um, the fluid that regulates um, the movement of balance and sound in your inner ear. So the way the water pills work or the diuretics work is they reduce the um, they're, they're thought to reduce the amount of endolymph or the amount of fluid in the inner ear um, and therefore reduce the amount of swelling okay now the way these diuretics work is they don't work directly in the inner middle inner ear they actually work on your kidneys okay um, I'm gonna bring out an embryology textbook so this, this is actually a very famous developing human textbook now this textbook basically the development of the kidneys actually is between the fifth and eighth week Okay, and it, it shows how the kidneys slowly develop, and you have these little tiny little things called nephrons, these tiny tiny little um, little circular um, C-shaped uh, uh, organism or, or or fluid tube, and the blood flows through it, and in the nephron, what happens is the fluid gets pushed out, okay, with salt and fluid, the fluid runs through this tiny little tubule all the way down and runs back up. And then the fluid and the salt gets reabsorbed in the distal part of the nephron. And so the way the body regulates the amount of salt and fluid in its system is it pushes out maybe 80% of the fluid and water from the blood. Um, and then it reabsorbs like 80-90% of the fluid in the distal tube. Well, what happens, What the way these diuretics work is these diuretics work in different ways to either one, increase the amount of fluid or salt you get pushed out, or two, block the amount of reabsorption of salt or fluid from the distal tubules, okay? And what's really, really interesting is that the development of the kidneys actually is a, it's a little bit earlier, but almost about the same time as the development of the middle ear complex. This is actually the development of the middle ear complex from you know, four weeks all the way up to 20 weeks. And again, uh, this is the uh, media scala, this, 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 this tiny little area here is wh where uh, the fluid gets excreted and uh, regulates the amount of fluid in your inner ear. So there actually may be some effects of the diuretic on the inner ear, but majority of the effects of the diuretic is on the kidneys. And what the kidneys do is they excrete salt and fluid and then these diuretics either block the reabsorption or increase the amount of salt that gets pushed out into the kidneys. So the, the mainstay of all these diuretics, there are four main categories of diuretics. And again, I'm going to use the uh, generic or scientific name because there's going to be five or six different brand names for the exact same drug from each different um, uh, pharmaceutical maker. So the, the, the primary or the first uh, category of drugs that, that it's just the main study that everyone uses for Meniere's is called the thiazides. And the most one common one you're going to see is the HCTZ, which stands for hydrochlorothiazide. Um, it's right here. You'll see this hydrochlorothiazide, um, HTCZ, 
and standardly dosing in 25 to 50 milligrams comes in this tiny little whitish pinkish pill um, again what this does is it blocks the reabsorption of the salt that the kidneys push out and therefore you um, pull out salt into your system and in your urine it makes you urinate a little extra salt the second medication or group of medications that we use with diuretics are called potassium sparing diuretics which are essentially the same medication, the same hydrochlorothiazide, but with that they add this called triamterine um, or another medication um, like, like triamterine and it, it creates this little blue pill. Okay, It's called um, triamterine hydrochlorothiazide. So it's the same medicine as hydrochlorothiazide except for it has another diuretic with it and what that does is again uh, it blocks the reabsorption of the salt but at the same time this this extra medication they put in there helps with the reabsorption of the potassium that you also lose um, and therefore you don't your potassium doesn't drop okay so a couple things I'm gonna say about these two is that the thiazides or the hydrochlorothiazide will cause you to lose potassium and a lot of times patients will have to take this extra potassium supplements called take K tabs or liquids come to this yellow tablet or the, or, or the big thing you want to take with it take a banana take some prunes, ton of potassium in it, and that'll help you from losing your extra potassium electrolytes which are essential for all cellular function. The third category of diuretics that, we, that are very very common are, uh, the, or not very common, but are not used as much are the carbonic and hydrase inhibitors. And, and this one's called acetosolamide or the, 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 the trade name's called Dimox. Okay? Um, not used as much uh, and, and very often and not very common because what this does is again it blocks the uh, sodium reabsorption in the distal um, kidneys uh, tubules however at the same time it actually causes uh, a buildup of bicarbonate so just like the, the thiazides block the potassium or the, so the sodium reabsorption but doesn't do anything for potassium the second potassium sparing blocks uh, the sodium reabsorption and but increases the potassium absorption. Well, this one actually blocks the sodium reabsorption. The carbonic anhydrase inhibitor blocks the sodium reabsorption, but at the same time, it sort of um, alters the reabsorption and, and, and the balance of the bicarbonate levels. Uh, we often give this acetazolamide for more patients who have uh, like called sleep apnea or COPD, where the lungs sort of retain extra bicarbonate, and then we have to offset that not as common of a medication but just as effective and works just as well as any of the other diuretics and the last diuretic that is very very extremely commonly used but not for Meniere's but commonly used for congestive heart failure are called the loop or high ceiling diuretics and what these do is again these actually increase the amount of sodium excretion and, and, and a very extreme level blocks the reabsorption of sodium and fluid actually even more than more than the sodium it blocks the fluid so you're actually going to lose more fluid than than salt compared to the hydrochlorothiazide and these this, these medications are called furosemide or bumetanide uh, the trade names are called lasix and bumex okay so again all these medications um, what they do is they hopefully pull out some of the extra salt from your system and help reduce some of that swelling or endolymph that we that would that develop in, in the in the ear, inner ear um, as a secondary measure. There may be some mild effects that these things do have on a cellular level in the middle inner ear, but the primary effects are mainly in your kidneys. And then because you lose the extra salt, it pulls out the extra hopefully extra fluid in the endolymph. A um, couple things I'm going to comment on is that the endolymph fluid, the fluid that is in the inner ear, is different is a different composition than the, the fluid that you have in your urine, okay? The uh, urine has primary sodium, potassium, water, and nitrates. Um, the inner ear has a higher, higher concentration of potassium. So um, just as a comment, uh, you, you do want to try to keep your potassium electrolyte levels up because the potassium is very, very important for your um, entire cellular metabolism. You're going to develop severe muscle cramps, body cramps, um, so you are going to have to take extra potassium supplements you know, with this K-tab if you're on a lot of these diuretics or take a banana. This banana is equivalent to about two to two and a half, two to two and a half of these tablets a day 
if not three of those tablets a day, or take a bunch of prunes. Prunes have a bunch of potassium in it along with fiber and uh, are helpful. So th that's sort of the idea behind diuretics. Um, the next video I'm gonna to talk to you about is 6.2 temporary drugs that block the symptoms. These are the, the classic drugs that people take during the drop attacks. Um, thanks.